everybody. Welcome to Industry Interviews with Sissa Strain. Hi, guys. This song is for our special guest today, Adam Case. <laughs> Hi, Adam Case. Hi. Welcome to Industry Interviews. How are you Thank today? you. I'm doing well. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here today. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. I am in Reno, Nevada. So I'm out west. My family is here. This is where I grew up. When everything um, hit in March, I was directing a production of Mamma Mia in Minnesota. And we'd gotten through a week of rehearsal and then found out everything was canceled. And uh, my two shows right after that, I was supposed to go to Canada right after to direct a production of Gentleman's Guide and then to Virginia to choreograph an opera and everything, you know, all the shows ended up um, postponing till another season or canceling. So um, my partner, Steve and I were like, do we want to go back to New York and sit in our apartment and wait this out? Or do we want to go out where there's mountains and fresh air and family and um, space to spread out? So we got on pl the plane and came out here instead of going home. So it, it breaks my heart to see what's happening in New York right now. I feel really removed from it, but I also feel very lucky to be able to be with my family. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining your CDI family today. Yay. Oh my um, gosh. I miss you all. We miss you too. I'm sure a lot of people watching know, but you are one of the core faculty of the Commercial Dance Intensive and also the author of The Business of Show. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you are a close friend and mentor to me personally. So Jill's here. Jordan's here. Look, everyone's here. Hey, Jill. I know. Remember when we found you in a swamp when you were 13? That was like the best find ever. <laughs> Would you like to give our audience, in case they don't know you, um, just a quick rundown of where you come from through your training and your career path till now? Okay, so <laughs> um, I grew up here in, well, not in this house. I grew up in Reno, Nevada. Um, and at the time in the 70s and 80s, the entertainment scene in Reno and Lake Tahoe was really booming. So most people think Nevada, they think Las Vegas and the entertainment that's going on there. Well, the strip as we know it today in Las Vegas really didn't balloon up to um, kind of what it's doing now until like the late 90s is when they started building those mega hotels and things like that. It was a much more, Vegas was a much more subtle existence, always had entertainment, but um, Reno and Tahoe were kind of on the same par as Vegas in, in terms of the acts that they were having coming in, the number of hotels, um, the, you know, the, the size of the productions and things like that. So it was a really booming industry here. Um, all the hotels and casinos had big um, uh, review shows with lots of professional singers and dancers who would move here from LA or Vegas or London or South Africa or Paris or, you know, wherever. Um, there was a show here, actually, that everybody should look up on YouTube. It was called Hello, Hollywood, Hello. And um, it was a show that opened the same year I was born in 1977. And um, it had a cast of 150 people. The stage it, that was built for it is three football fields big and had like this huge $20 million budget in 1977, which if you think about inflation, that's like huge. But what it did is it brought all of these amazing professional dancers to Reno and a lot of them opened dance studios. And um, we had these incredible mentors who um, took my group kind of under their wing. There's a lot of professional dancers in New York and LA that became, that were a part of this group that grew up in Reno during this time and went on to do um, a lot of work as performers and choreographers and directors and writers. Uh, so it was a really special time to be here. Uh, and we, you know, we did competitions um, and conventions. So like, I remember when um, LA Dance Force started and the edge opened in LA I, um, because our teachers, you know, they would come up and work with us. And, and now I, I work for Rhonda Miller at Pace University, but I've known Rhonda Miller since I was 11 and she started the edge and started LA Dance Force, which is really special to actually be able to work with her now at Pace. Um, uh, but different conventions, competitions, 
Um, I always knew I really loved theater. I loved musical theater, but we didn't really have a lot of musical theater here. A couple of the high schools did musicals, mine didn't. Reno didn't, musical theater wasn't a big part of our culture here the way that casino entertainment was. Um, every so often we'd have a musical come through town, but I, you know, Broadway was like this dream, but it didn't seem accessible because New York was 3000 miles away. I got to go there one time when I was 10 and see 42nd Street on Broadway and like, it was so inspiring, but it didn't really seem real. Um, hey, Sophia. <laughs> I love her. She's an incredible dancer. She lives in California. And she's also a nurse. So, Sophia, yay. Um, anyway, so um, the other cool thing about Reno is that when we turned 18, there was opportunity to start working professionally um, whether like some of my friends did like full-time shows in, in the hotels, um, and you know, we were seniors in high school, so, so they, we'd go to school during the day and, um, they would perform the shows at night, but we also got to do like industrials and, and things like that, conventions, uh, corporate things that would come through. So I got to get my feet wet professionally in Reno before I actually, um, went to college and like launched a career. Um, I decided I wanted to study theater, so I got my degree, my theater degree at University of Utah in Salt Lake City, which was great. Um, because I'd always danced from the time I was eight years old, uh, I just wanted to expand my knowledge. I was able to still dance in college and, and take classes and choreograph in the ballet department and, and choreograph for theater productions. but. Um, really got to learn about things that I hadn't thought much about before, like set design, costume design, lighting, stage management, directing, script analysis. Um, I mostly was uh, sort of focusing on acting at the time. So, uh, you know, basic acting skills, but also, um, you know, acting for period styles like, you know, Moliere or, you know, things from um, Shakespeare different different eras in, in Western theater, um, dialects, auditions, uh, TV and film, and all that stuff that I had not really had access to as a kid, but I wanted to just expand and learn about, not really knowing necessarily how I would use it in my career. Um, I, I had no idea. I mean, I didn't know I was going to be a director or an author, but, you know, later in life. So I was just kind of following the paths that opened for me. And so then um, in college, I was able to continue working professionally because Salt Lake City had a lot of equity theaters. Utah had a lot of equity theaters um, and professional theaters. So um, I could work and, and perform at Pioneer Theater Company, um, you know, at night and then still do my academics during the day and things like that. So, or go do summer stock in the summer and things like that. So I, even though I was in college and I was immersed in the study of theater, I was finding those ways that I could get my feet wet professionally um, to learn what those standards were for working, um, to, to network um, and meet different performers and, and directors and choreographers from outside of uh, my regular circle. And it was during a production of Crazy For You at Pioneer Theater Company. I think I was either 19 or 20 years old where it was my first time working with a cast of people that were like all from New York. There were a few of us that were local, but mostly the cast was from New York and the leads playing the leads in our show had played the leads on Broadway, which was super cool. Um, one of the, the woman who played Polly was actually an unknown at the time. Her name is Nancy Anderson. And now she's like this huge Broadway star, but it, she was kind of young in her career. So that was super cool. Um, and I just, I met some other mentors, um, a woman named Lori Alexander, a woman named Lisa Mandel, who sort, they were from New York and they sort of took me under their wing and they were like, you know, you should think about moving to New York. And I was like, oh no, I'm, you know, I'm going to move to Vegas. I'm going to like be a showboy, And th that's what I thought I would do. And they were like, well, you know, options could be open to you. Think about it. And so um, I did, I decided, you know, I'm, I, I do want to move to New York. Broadway maybe isn't as um, inaccessible as I thought, uh, you know, and this was before um, 
you know, certainly before Instagram, before Facebook, before the internet, really, as we knew it, email was kind of new when I was in college. I didn't get a cell phone until like I graduated from college. And that was like the big Ericsson, you know, that would heat up if you talked on it for more than three minutes. I'm pretty sure like all of us from that era are going to have like brain tumors later in life because it's not good to hold those things up to the side of your head. But we did. Um, you so, no, well, but my point is like things were not accessible the way that they are now. The only time we saw Broadway was on the Tony Awards, unless she went to New York. That was it maybe a national tour would come through. Salt Lake City got a lot of national tours, which was cool. Um, but we just, you know, it wasn't a real thing to me. And in fact, most of the kids that I grew up dancing with went to LA because that was the close city for us. And we, you know, we would go take class there when we were kids. And, and so it felt like that was more of the accessible community. Uh, but anyway, so after college, I didn't want to move to New York right away. So I got a job actually working for Disney World as a kid of the kingdom. And that we were like the Mouseketeers. We dance on the castle and, or, or sorry, on the stage in front of the castle with Mickey and Minnie and all of your Disney friends. And um, they were really technically hard shows. We're like, you know, triple pirouette, fan kick layout on the left sort of business. <laughs> Um, but it was while I was at Disney World that I met Casey Noblet. And so we've known each other for over 20 years at this point. Um, she's going to kill me because that's going to date her and everybody will know how old she is. But I will say she's younger than me. Um, just not much, by much. But, uh, you know, Casey came into my life and we were, you know, we we both taught, we both, you know, had had visions for like being dance educators, but we were focused on performing and, um, you yeah, know, we were just like two young dancers with like dreams, but we definitely like connected um, on a, <laughs> she's throwing up. Um, <laughs> she, uh, we definitely connected on um, like this really great level. Um, some other people too that are associated with with CDI I met through my years at Disney. So I did that. Then I went on a cruise ship and um, saved up a, a bunch of money. And um, I worked for a company called Stiletto Entertainment that was producing for Holland America. And I was a dance captain for them. And that company brought like a lot of people into my life, including Jill Hillier, who is on um, our faculty for CDI as well, um, which I, I mean, Jill's taught me so much in my life. She's amazing. Um, so I, I worked for Hall in America as a dance captain and performer, uh, dancer, singer. And after that, I moved to New York and um, just started auditioning, started doing, you know, what we do, uh, bartending at a Broadway theater, trying to go to the auditions that I could, teaching in New Jersey on the weekends, um, struggling struggling and um you know the, the the young new yorkers right now are going to kill me but uh i lived in harlem that first year in a three-bedroom apartment and i think i paid four hundred dollars and i thought it was a lot of money <laughs> and i was like i could never afford midtown my friends have to pay like eight hundred dollars a month for a one-bedroom apartment in midtown i could never pay that much <laughs> <laughs> but like we were earning as much than either it's all like relative but now it's like that three bedroom apartment that we paid twelve hundred dollars for in harlem is easily three thousand dollars a month and it's the same crappy apartment like you know um same thing in uh you know in midtown now that, that eight hundred dollar like one bedroom or studio apartment is going for like two thousand dollars a month and it's the same crappy apartment and it's been a crappy apartment since it was built in like 1900 but so now it has charm now it's charming. <laughs> it was a struggle for sure you know it's all relative to like inflation and and how much money you can make and whatnot um, but I, you know, I did what I could and I auditioned in New York and it took me, um, a while to even get noticed. Um, eventually I booked a national tour of the Wizard of Oz and I went and did that for like three or three or four months. Um, came back, um, 
started like judging for dance competitions, started doing uh, traveling workshops on the weekends. Um, Casey started in house productions where uh, we would go do in studio workshops. Um, and that's where we met you, Melissa, and like many other people that are still in my life. Um, there was a new convention starting called Dancers Inc. And Dan Barris, who was the founder, uh, found me and asked me to be a part of that. And so I was a founding faculty member of that and toured with them for like at least 10 years um, as a director. Um, so I got to be in more, more communities around the country and meet a lot more, um, work with a lot of studios through both End House and uh, Dancers Inc. Um, eventually, Stiletto Entertainment asked me to come back and be an associate choreographer director for a new ship they had coming out, which was called the Osterdam. This was in 2003, I want to say. Um, and at first I was really unsure if I wanted to do that because I was still so focused on performing, but you know, they were like, well, why don't you like take a chance? And I thought, okay, maybe I should listen to these folks because I loved them. Um, they they were an incredible company to work for as a dancer. And so I did trust them. And um, the first shows that I worked on for them, I was assisting people like Tommy Toon and Patty Colombo and John Sharon, um, who are all like huge in the in the industry. Joey Peasy, who is, is a major um, choreographer now as well. And um, you know, and, and I got to work more closely with Jill. I got to work with my friend, Lisa Lair, who is now the vice president of entertainment for Celebrity Cruise Lines. Um, you know, you just, you never know like who you're gonna meet when you say yes to opportunity. Um, so that actually started, that job started me learning about the other side of the table. Like, how do you direct a show? How do you pace through a show? How do you build a number as a choreographer? How do you showcase a performer's talents? How do you talk to the lighting designer? And, you know, and, and incorporate the scenic design and just like the overall creative direction of a show. And surprisingly, a lot of the vocabulary that I'd learned in college about lighting design and scenic design and directing and stage management all came into play in what I was doing. So I understood what people were talking about, thank God. Um, even if I didn't have the skill set yet, but it was a lot of like, shut up and learn and take it in and, you know, contribute where you can. But like, I was learning from some of the best people in the industry of uh, commercial and Broadway theater that you could possibly um, learn from. So uh, I did, I consider, I consider that period of time in my life with Stiletto to be my biggest training ground in uh, being a, a choreographer and a director. Um, and it really ignited something in me that I was much more excited about that than performing even. I get uh, more satisfaction out of choreographing and directing than I ever did as a performer. And so um, in my early 20s, I started to see that like the pathway that I thought I was gonna have as a dancer really wasn't what I wanted. Um, and my goals changed and, and different opportunities came to me. And I was an associate for a lot of different choreographers and directors. One would pass me on to the next, to the next, to the next, um, to where eventually I was working on Broadway, but on the other side of the table, uh, which is not at all. If you would have asked me at age 16, I would have never told you that this is what my career would be at all. I had no idea. Uh, but I just kept walking through the doors that opened and said yes to people that offered me a, a chance. And um, that's how I built my career. That's a long story. It's and now I'm back story. in Reno, Nevada, where I ended up because, you know, we don't know what's happening. <laughs> that's right. It's, it's such an incredible path. Um, so my first question technically for the industry interviews um, is you sort of touched on it, but I'm going to rephrase it a little bit for you. So the original question okay. is how did you book your first job? My new question for you is what was it like when you found out that you booked your first job? Um, I, uh, I mean, some of my first jobs were, were small things. 
um, in town where choreographers, because they knew me through my dance studio, they just hired me. Um, and I think I was like really excited, but I don't, I honestly don't remember too much about it. Um, when I booked the Disney job, like that was my first like post college, like you can support yourself as a dancer kind of job that I had. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, that was kind of a lifesaver. I'd also just gone through like a really traumatic uh, period in my life. Uh, my best friend all through college had just died. Um, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I had two job offers at the same time. One was the Disney job and the other um, was to go be a part of a dance company in Utah uh, that is artistic directed by Daryl Yeager, who's in this incredible choreographer and director. Um, I, I believe it's called Odyssey Dance now. It had a different name at the time, but it's now called Odyssey Dance. And he does incredible work. And I was like, do I go the company route? Do I go Disney? And I just felt like I needed to get out of Utah. And so that's why I went and did the Disney job. So not only was I excited to work for this incredible company, but um, I needed a life change. And that opportunity came to me at the exact moment that I needed it. So it was like divine intervention. <laughs> um, I, I was that. really thankful. I was very thankful. It's interesting the way that our lives can change based on those sorts of decisions. And it's totally, you know, you can look back on your career and understand different reasons why different things happened, you know? Right. Well, that's what um, I forget who told me. It might have been Alicia Albright, who's a Broadway dancer in Frozen. But she she was like, you can't connect the dots forwards. You can only connect them backwards when it's all done. That's cool. Um, and I, I'm like, that's so perfect. Cool. OK, so my second question for you, Adam, what is something in your career that surprised you? I mean, I think the business of show, writing that book and the success of that book was a huge surprise to me. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't, um, I, I, I wrote it, I started writing it, I think in like 2012 or 2013 is when I started mm -hmm. the, the initial research for it. Um, and I interviewed almost a hundred people throughout the industry to kind of com compile all of this information. Um, I was, I'd never written a book before. I didn't really consider myself much of a writer. Um, I thought I was maybe writing an article for a dance magazine or something. Um, but this project just sort of started taking off and I didn't even have a publisher at the time. I didn't know how I was going to publish it or what I was going to do. And um, I just was compelled to write it. And in between dance and choreography jobs, I was able to work on it. And so it took me a while to do it. And then once I figured out how I wanted to publish it and the editor editing process and all that, that took about a year as well. Um, so it was like one of, one of those things where I, I, I had no um, credibility as a writer. Um, you know, my, my own success in my own career was like my own individual path, but you know, it, it wasn't the same as other people around me. So um it was just kind of like, I'm going to put this out there and see what happens. I didn't even really necessarily have a goal for it, except to have a, to help um, dancers, young dancers who I already knew, um, or, or performers in general. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted a resource I could be like, here, um, this is something that I learned from 100 different people. Uh, but it was interesting once I started putting it out there, the feedback that I was getting from a lot of educators and people that run dance and theater programs around the country that were like, um, wow, this is a resource that we didn't know we needed, but it's kind of the missing link um, in terms of what you've created for our students. Um, and that led to a lot of different like speaking engagements for me, like as a public speaker, which is not something that I'd ever thought about myself as doing. Um, it allowed me a lot more opportunities to get into higher ed, um, academia as a guest artist, um, which has turned into like a passion of mine, um, higher ed. Um, you know, I, as a dancer in Reno at age 16, you're going to be an author that 
has a book that's selling not only all over the United States, but all over the world, never, never would have guessed. And I mean, that book changes lives. And I know that sounds kind of dramatic, but there are so many people who feel lost when they try to decide to do something brave, like move to New York, move to LA, move to some place because they don't have someone like you to take them under their wing and share, you know, how things work. What is the norm in the industry? And the information that's in your book is like a starter kit for your career. And thank it's, you. It's amazing. Like about, I, thank I you so much. <laughs> thank you. No, I, you know, mentorship is like one of the most important aspects of of dance and theater as an art form um since the time theater and dance began it's been a process of you know a teacher passing down the knowledge to the apprentice to the student um to the audience or whoever that is and it's like an oral tradition and it's a uh, you know a physical tradition um where we're passing that information on and so many programs are very focused on the technique of it, which is awesome. Like, you know what I mean? Because we have to like have that skill set. But for people that want to make a living in the industry and, you know, make it their livelihood and be able to pay their bills and survive, th that's not always a part of the conversation. Um, because it's hard. It's so much information to try to like pack into one program, you know, like, so I, I think a lot of college programs have um, incorporated it more and more over the past 10 years. I think that that's been changing. Um, but, you know, I was lucky here in Reno when I was a kid, all of these professional dancers that moved here from Vegas and LA and, and Europe and, you know, wherever, um, they made that a part of our education and they provided us with opportunities and networking very, very early on um, in, in, terms of, in terms of like learning that business side of it, even if it was for this small community um, or helping us network. Like I said, a lot of my friends went to LA, like helping them know the movers and shakers in LA so that when they moved there, they could have a mentorship opportunity. And so um, I wanted to create something that was, you can't replace that mentorship, but that would sort of supplement that, especially for people that might not have those relationships with their teachers. Absolutely. And it is so special. And once again, thank you. You. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So my next industry interview question for you, what is the one style or skill you wish that you had trained in before you became a professional? Hmm. Um, I think, I mean, in terms of dancing, I like the styles that I was training in were pretty diverse. Um, I wish I would have, especially in college, had more time to focus on my voice training. Um, I had, you know, I had, I had some voice training. Um, I think I had natural ability in voice, but I wish I would have really focused on that much more because I think at least initially in New York, that was something that was holding me back. Um, mm -hmm. That I didn't, I didn't have quite that same like placement and training that um, other people did that I was auditioning next to. Um, but I was so focused on dance and, and acting too in college that I neglected that um more than I should have I hear you on that um okay so my next question for you um other than focusing more on your voice and training if you could go back in time and give advice to your 15 year old self what would you say and why um I would say dream big but don't worry about comparing yourself to other people mm. I was never the best dancer in my studio ever um there were there were a couple other guys in my school that I mean were like they're still two of my favorite dancers Scott Hislop and Hunter Hamilton like they're they're amazing they live in LA and they work in LA um and I I feel like 
Um, I compared myself to them a lot technique wise. Um, I was also kind of like the skinny scrawny kid. And, you know, in the casino culture, everybody was like, super big and buffed out and, and that sort of thing. And, and it was I put a lot of unnecessary pressure on myself thinking that I had to dance like Scott or thinking that I had to look like some of these other people in order to have a career um which as it turns out I didn't need to dance as well as Scott and I didn't have to look like those um other folks I just had to figure out what my own type was and my own skill set and then how to use that to my best advantage in in the work that I wanted to do like I didn't even go into the same industry as, as either of those folks so it didn't really matter you know like we all like went in our own direction our own path so um but I, I remember like putting a lot of pressure on myself to be like who I thought other people wanted me to be or needed me to be instead of just being who I was and focusing on, you know, um, bettering myself as much as I could and then going on my own path because ultimately, you know, I just kept going through the doors that opened for me and those doors of opportunity that, that were available for me weren't available for other people and their doors weren't available for me and vice versa, because you can only, you know, go on the journey that you can go on. You're not going to, nobody's going to have an identical path in this career anyway. So like why, why, why worry about trying to like make an identical career path? Uh, what's that question? Talk about? Kelsey says, how does one do that? You're not the first to talk about having a niche within the marketplace. What, what do you think it means to have like that foot in the door? Sure. You know what? That that's I feel like that is one of the the first huge hurdles of going from like amateur student to professional dancer because you're jumping into such an unknown, right? You, like you have like all of all of this training, you want to be versatile and and all this kind of stuff and you don't really know how you're going to fit into the market. And the thing is, I don't think like when you first start out that anybody actually really knows or is meant to know. Um, so my advice is this, what kind of work do you want to do? You know, I, I wanna do everything, great. Can you focus it down a little bit? Like what, what's really calling you? Like for me, it was Broadway, Broadway, Broadway. I like, I loved musicals. And it's not that I didn't appreciate like, you know, I'm a big Madonna tour. Like, that was amazing. But I also, like, I couldn't, like, fully, you know, like, well, going back to comparing people, like, looking at the types of people that were working in that industry, I would have had to change so much about how I looked and who I was to try to fit into that, that I knew that that wasn't really what my calling was. Whereas, like, I could look at the Broadway community, I'm like, oh, my God, there's, like, a lot of people that fit in this kind of same genre. And so I think if you can make yourself some like goals in terms of paring down your dreams to some specifics, like I really want to work in the LA hip hop market um, or like, you know, Cassidy Noblet is a great example. Like when he was training, he, he started getting into hip hop and was like, I really want to get into the concert tours and, you know, started like meeting the people and, and, um, networking and working with the choreographers that were kind of like working in that world. Um, so if, if you can get yourself to a place where you can associate with the kind of work that you seek, I feel like that's a great at least step in the right direction where you're, you're putting yourself in opportunities where success or, or opportunity in general can come to you. Um, you know, if you're, if you're sitting in Omaha waiting for the casting director from, you know, the, the JLo show to call you <laughs> in Vegas, like, it's not going to happen. You have to kind of st figure out how you're going to put yourself in the path where opportunity can even happen. So strategy, thinking about that, like, how, can you take classes from these choreographers or casting directors who are working in this part of the industry? Can you... Um, 
be taking classes w with the dancers that are working in this industry so you can start to study the way that they move and the magnetism that they have and then you know look at yourself in the mirror and see like okay how do you move how can if, if you know how can you continue to refine what you do so that more of you comes out in that work in that world um and and sort of pursuing those small goals like that um there's more opportunity that maybe you can start to figure out that niche further um additionally you know it takes three years in a new market for people to even know who you are so you also have to have patience and we live in a society now where we're used to instant gratification you mm -hmm. know magic silver box in our hand that can tell us any information in the world at the drop of a hat we don't even have to type we just ask siri like what to do um exactly the industry has not worked like that and never will work like that that i can see so you have to have patience and you have to just keep like showing up and um being willing to put yourself out there Absolutely. Uh, I can agree with you more. There's a question from Sophia. From your perspective as a choreographer and casting in musical theater, what are some qualities about dancers that made you want to hire them? Um, well, networking is a huge thing. If I already know somebody before they come in the audition room, that is actually huge. And I'm not alone in that. Um, so be, and the reason that's important is because if I know if I'm hiring that person, I kind of already know what I'm getting a little bit, which is, uh, helps me know like who I want to spend eight hours a day in a rehearsal room with. So that's, you know, that can be an advantage if it's somebody that I already know. If it's somebody that I don't know, it honestly, A, it depends on the project. What's the specific vision for the project? If I'm a choreographer working with a director, what's the director's vision for the project and the types of people and what does the writer want? You know, we're kind of, there, there's so many things about a project that are bigger than just how good somebody's technique is. So I'm kind of looking at a big picture of like type-wise who might fit into the project. Um, I'm certainly looking at technique. But for me, because I work in theater a lot of times, I'm really looking to see, like, what kind of acting can you bring to the table? What kind of character, what kind of energy can you bring to this choreography? You know, if you fall out of a double turn, I know, like, that you either fell out of the double turn because you can't do a double turn or because you just happen to fall out of a double turn today. Like, I'm not worried about perfection. I, I'm an educator. Like, I can see, like, if the technique is there or not. So people that get so in their head and they're afraid to make a mistake in the choreography that they forget to perform or actually bring themselves to it mm. doesn't really show me very much in an audition that's exciting. I want to see, like, how can you take this movement and interpret it as an actor? What are you going to bring to the table that's interesting? Because the last thing I want to do as a director or choreographer is spoon feed you. I don't want to give you every beat. I don't want to give you every character look, every interaction. I want to know that I'm working with somebody who is super creative and fun and has an energy that is not judgmental, but is open um, to the process and somebody who's willing to explore and, and be an artist. I think that is so special. I feel like in your classes that people take, um, you get most excited when you're watching people who are making choices. Oh, I totally do. I can't take my eyes off them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure. It's so fun. Because it brings something more to, to what you are putting out there. And, and that's the excitement of working with other artists, like you're saying. I, I love people who make my choreography look way better than I can make it look. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like I said, I'm never the best dancer in the room. Um, but it's so exciting to me when somebody who has like really great technique, but doesn't have to think about it, can like come into the choreography and just like be a character and find nuances and things about it that I didn't even know existed and who can make it look so good, like beyond my wildest dreams. Someone asked, do you have advice for people who feel like they're not getting noticed in auditions? Um, I do. Sometimes we're not always as self-aware in auditions as we think we are. Um, we being so, the dancer or the cast? Yeah, 
No, well, A, casting is not an exact science. So we can't pretend that it is. But I feel like sometimes people go into the audition mindset and they might get cut and feel like, well, I was the best dancer in the room. How, how dare they cut me? And for me, I'm like, well, first of all, check that energy. Because it, if, that, if, if you're in that room in that space and you're like, I'm the best person in here, um, sometimes that energy comes across as really negative even if it's not intended that way. Yeah. Um, and that's something in terms of like that awareness that I think is really important to like hone in on, like what energy are you bringing into the room? So that's A. B, say you're not that person and say that, um, I think it was Steven Montalvo um, who was asking, I, actually Steven is one of my favorite dancers of all time. He was a stiletto dancer as well. Um, and now he has a studio in California. So say you are somebody that comes in with good energy, you're surrounded by people that the choreographer knows, and you just can't seem to get noticed by that choreographer. A, the fact that you are getting called into that room means that you're working at a very high level. Because if you're in a room where the choreographer already knows everybody, you're in some, you're in an invited call which means that the casting director knows you, you, you know, or your agent is pushing for you or something like you actually, you have people in your corner and it might just be a period of time where it like the choreographer and director needs to get to know you. So this is why like in the business of show, I talk a lot about like strategies for marketing and people that work in marketing uh, where they say like, you have to see a product seven times before it enters your consciousness. Minimum seven times. So think about like, what is the most popular soda in the world? What do you say, Melissa? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, it's the obvious answer. Maybe Pepsi is a close second, right? Who has more advertising worldwide than any other soft drink? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola these huge fortune 500 companies who their branding is really well known. It's because they're bombarding us with advertising, right? They're always in our consciousness. So on a ma on a micro level in an audition situation or a market situation, maybe that choreographer has only seen you twice or three times. It might take seven times for them to, for you to even be on their radar. Um, additionally, in terms of like personal interaction, a lot of uh, business people say that it takes, th you have to like make some sort of like personal contact with somebody three times before they understand who you are, um, wh whether it's in an interview situation um, or like, you know, consultants or like whatever that is, like you have to like reach out and touch somebody three times before like they will remember your name. So that's another thing to think about. Like, here's this creative team in this room, right? This director, this choreographer, this musical director, this casting director, and any assistants, right? And if they've only collectively seen you one time, you might not be on their radar. But whereas there are five or six other people who have been on their radar like many times. So their eye is already going to them. They're already processing them. It can, that's why it can take three years in a market before anybody even knows who you are. That's why you have to have patience. So, you know, you're going to these auditions, you're not getting noticed. Is it the same choreographer and creative team every time? Is it the same dancers every time? You know, like every, every situation is a little bit different. And maybe in the first year, you're not getting noticed. Maybe like three years from now, you're the one being noticed all the time because you have to keep staying in that numbers game. You have to keep going back to it. It's different than like being in a smaller market, like say you're in Philadelphia or say you're um, even in Washington DC, which is a smaller market, um, Atlanta that's a more medium sized market. You might get noticed sooner in a smaller market, but New York is huge. LA is huge. Chicago is huge. There are thousands and thousands of dancers in that city. And as a choreographer and an educator, I am constantly having new dancers come into my consciousness all the time. My brain can't necessarily track that. I'm only human. Mm -hmm. A casting director is only human. It's their job to track that, but like 
they're seeing thousands of people a week. <laughs> Choreographers are seeing thousands of people every month. Um, you know, sort of thinking about it on that flip side on what, what is this experience like on the other side of the table can sometimes give you so much more insight into auditioning than being the auditionee yourself. That's why whenever people have an opportunity to be on the other side of the table in an audition experience, mm -hmm. I say like, take it because you'll learn so much. Like I, like I pulled you in on projects. So you're not right for this at all, but I want you to be in the room because I want you to like learn what you can learn. It you was know? incredible. It was the, the first time you asked me to come in. I think I had been my second time around in New York. I had been here for about six months. And then I was sitting in the room with you behind the table and I, you know, I didn't have any say in anything whatsoever, but just absorbing everything was incredible. And you're right because, you know, what we focus on when we're auditioning, we, we think all the technical things like you're talking about before the most important when in reality, it's mm -hmm. having a presence and being an effective communicator and like being totally fresh, like being fresh I feel like was the most exciting thing you're like oh someone made a choice like because you're breaking right up the whole right day, you know and it, and it's hard to know like what those choices will be even in that moment mm -hmm. um auditioning is a technique for sure it's not an, an inherent skill you know, it, it, it's not something that people just know how to do. Like people really study it. There's, I feel like there's a lot more classes available for um, audition technique when it comes to uh, vocal technique or vocal auditions, Correct. Um, monologue yeah. auditions and things like that. We don't really have them for dance as much. I try to do them in New York when I can through like the growing studio, through um, uh, Stage Door Connection and some other companies like that. Um, but it is kind of few and far between, but there is strategy to dance auditioning. Well, of course, commercial dance intensive. Yes, <laughs> we do. And, and um, I don't know, I feel like from our CDI students, for sure, hear a lot of feedback about like the insight that they get from all of the different audition workshops we do. Like Lucille DeCampley does one for um, auditioning and, and Lisa from GoTo uh, Talent does, does that. Cassidy does the LA commercial audition and things. And, and um, you know, it's so much more than taking class and learning a combo in terms of what that audition experience really is. I think it's important mm -hmm. that dancers also take the opportunities to take those audition technique classes when they're available. Absolutely. So Adam, I have one more industry interview question for you uh, officially. Yes. Uh, I'm so excited okay. that everyone has been asking questions. I love. I know. It's awesome. I know. It's so great. Um, you're such a resource and we're lucky to have you. Um, my last Thank question you. for you. And um, this comes from Casey Noblet's favorite podcast, How I Built This. So the question uh -huh. is, for your success, what percent? is based in luck and what percent is based in talent and skill? I would have to say 100% luck and 100% talent and skill. <laughs> because it, I mean, it, it's hard to quantify it because I think most of my job opportunities have come to me through being in the right place at the right time. But if you also don't have the skill set in that moment to be ready for it, then luck doesn't mean it. So that's why it's important. Like, you, you know, you've got to train, you've got to have you doing that work so that when opportunity arrives, you're ready for it. They're equal. They're equal. Adam Case, thank you so much for joining us. Commercial Dance Intensives. Thank you. Interviews. We love you so much. Thanks. Love you guys too. Everybody stay safe out there through all of this craziness, just, you know, do what you can day to day, be good to yourselves, be patient, do what you can do and don't sweat the rest of it. Cause we don't know what the end of it, what it's going to look like on the other side of this. So do what you can do today and love you all much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa. Good luck. My name's Adam Cates. Are you ready to work? Yeah. Is it five, six, seven, eight? Yeah. It's time to begin.